Hi, my name is Hillary Anderson, and my husband and I live and ranch in southwest Montana. And we consider ourselves very lucky to get to be a part of this incredible landscape. And so what I am very honored to get to do today is share with you a little bit of what our life and work means to us and the invaluable role that I think we as a collective community all play and, and the opportunity we all have to contribute to a story that is actually um, sometimes framed up as a one versus another very competitive one um, and instead kind of shed some light on an opportunity to collaborate and in doing so all take ownership in the collective future that we choose to realize together. So with that, this first picture is a picture of our home ranch. Um, we raise grass-fed beef uh, in Southwest Montana, and we run cattle across a number of different land bases, all of which surround or are within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, because of that, we, the ranch not only supports livestock, um, but we're also, we also support uh, a number of wolves. In particularly, we usually have one to two packs on a, on a yearly basis that um, come across the ranch. In this case, this particular picture was from a pack that denned on the ranch. Um, in 1997, when wolves were first starting to come out of Yellowstone after they were reintroduced to the park, they actually came onto the ranch. And uh, since then, we've we've had wolves, and it's been quite an adventure figuring out how to coexist with them, and has really led to some deeper questions and learning on on our part. And I'll share some of that with you here as we go. We also support uh, a growing population of grizzly bears. The ranch uh, is the the ranch and the ranching communities that surround Yellowstone host one of the top three highest densities of grizzly bears currently in the United States. And they're also uh, they're quite a humbling creature to live alongside and present a number of challenges that we've chosen to meet with creativity. Along with those two species, uh, some of the things that we're very proud of on the ranch um, are a very robust migratory bird species. We also have, we also are working with a number of different endangered species, one of which was the sage grouse and through the sage grouse initiative partnered with a number of different neighbors and organizations uh, to to keep the species protected and conserve habitat. We currently have uh, one of only two populations of Arctic grayling left in the in the lower 48 states uh, on a stream that runs through the ranch. And we we're also home to a lot of elk and deer and pronghorn and trumpeter swans and uh, also a lot of native grass species and, and plants. And so along with all of these different species, there's also us and our cattle. The cattle are an interesting component to the landscape because while there's no question that ranching done in a traditional way opens up a lot of opportunity for discussion on um, rather destructive forms of human use of a landscape. The other side of the story is that ranching done right opens up a lot of opportunity for dynamic, complex ecosystems to thrive. And in the midst of all of that, we're here making a living and holding this landscape open. 
I wanted to share these two maps, um, mainly the one that's actually looking kind of blurry right now with the purple dots on it. Because when I saw, when I first saw this, um, it was really interesting to me. It was, uh, un I understood the reality from living it, but seeing this picture really helped pull the importance into even more focus. So the, the purple dots are wolf packs in Southwest Montana. And as you can see, a huge majority of them exist in areas that are um, white and white is private land. Green are green is uh, green and yellow is public land. And so the lower the this lower line of packs, this area and this area are both areas where we run <clears throat> where we run cattle. And the picture of the wolves that I showed is is these guys right here. And so I think a really important point in conversation that's often missed is the fact that ranching done right holds incredible opportunity to maintain open space and is actually in, very integral in the conservation of many of these wildlife that we all deeply care about. And the alternative to open space is an alternative human use is this. And so this top picture is Seattle. The This picture right here is Boulder. And this lower picture is my home, Bozeman, Montana. And all, all of these used to be robust habitat for wolves, grizzly bears, sage grouse, and the other species that I mentioned. But due to human use in this form, these species no longer exist here. So an important point on ranching, I think, is that keeping ranches open and working protects the landscape from these other forms of human use that while they're important and a, a reality in our society today, don't lend themselves very well to coexistence. And because of human use on landscapes in this way, there's an, a, a growing amount of pressure on ranches to be the last spaces where these wildlife can exist, to function as corridors for connectivity and, and realize the conservation goals that we are realizing today. So this is, this is our backyard and we're working very hard to keep it this way. <laughs> An interesting challenge, I think I mentioned at the beginning is that we, we've had a tendency to think of uh, conservation and agriculture as inherently in competition to one another and nothing brings that out more than discussions around wolves and coexistence or grizzly bears and coexistence. And often in those conversations, the rancher is painted out as the bad guy, when in reality, you know, ranchers are trying to make a living. And in many cases, we actually value these wildlife very, very much. But there are certain realities that that are more present in our everyday life than than one might appreciate if they or then one might appreciate if they aren't living those realities every day. So it requires some creative thinking to figure out how to blend all of these values and make something work. And what we've come to realize is that these challenges really aren't solved on the level of methods. Um, and they're certainly not solved on the level of, of conflict mitigation. What we've really realized is that these challenges and, and the power to move the collective into a better place is realized through this idea of ranch resilience, which for us is, uh, takes the form of regenerative ranching or regenerative agriculture. 
And so instead of supporting a self-destructive system, which we look at as being a system of take and use and deplete and manipulate, regenerative agriculture to us means a self-sustaining system where one action or one input into an area of the ranch is, is pulled through the, the entirety of the ranch to help the system hold itself to support the system in growing and thriving, which means expanding diversity and complexity uh, and through, through valuing all life forms uh, on the ranch. For us most recently, uh, we've, we've literally gone down below the surface and are starting to explore what the role of soil and healthy soil, microbiology, organic matter, all of these different words that I don't know, <laughs> how they are all contributing to a healthy system above ground and really starting to understand that harmful practices above ground are creating harmful conditions below ground. And what we really need is a healthy, thriving biological community underground to create the plant community and the diverse wildlife community we see above ground. Again, what we do above ground matters below the surface. And so one, one practice that we've really invested in is this idea of mimicking the bison or managing our cattle as herd units, understanding that the way the, the original relationship between land and grazer was one that sustained both landscape and grazer. And while their bison are gone and cattle have replaced them, the, the goal for us is to manage the land through our management of cattle. And then it's not, it's not the grazer that is the problem, it's the management of the grazer that's been the problem. And so if we can manage cattle in ways that promote that self-sustaining system, uh, we'll all be better off. And so in this picture, you can see there's two riders. Uh, we do a lot of herding or gathering of cattle and moving them around the range, again, mimicking the way that the bison would have impacted the land and used one area and moved on. So our cattle are traditionally cattle are kind of churned out and scattered across the range. And that creates a whole host of issues for the soil and the health of the soil, as well as the health and richness of the species above ground, the, the grasses and the plants. And so um, in a nutshell, we simply don't use one area more than once each season. And the cattle are kept gathered like this and moving around and they're, they're not left anywhere for more than a day or two at a time. And the interesting thing that we've found in managing cattle like this, in this particular pasture, in a picture similar to this, we've actually watched wolves and grizzly bears come into contact with, with pairs, which are mothers and babies, uh, and interact with the cattle. And the cattle, when gathered up like this, they mother up and they stand their ground really well, and they've actually ran both wolves and bears off. And that's a very different sort of system than um, either engaging in, in conflict prevention from trying to keep wolves away from cattle or from dealing with the aftermath, which is dead livestock and then eventually dead wolves. So what we've learned is that this is a great example of that regenerative or self-sustaining ideas. So one input, which is our effort to herd cattle produces a lot of other outputs that pull the whole system into really fluid alignment, 
when we're when we're working with cattle like this, not only are we out there with our cattle spending time noticing if anything is sick or injured, we're also observing the range and the range condition. We're reading the land and determining when we need to move cattle. We're looking at um, cow dung to see what form it's in, which tells us a lot about their health and their diet. We're counting species of dung beetles in the cow pies, which is telling us about the microbial life below the surface and the function of the whole system. We're setting our cattle up to be more resilient or less vulnerable in the face of, of predators and thus allowing predators to have access across the entire landscape without the conflict. Um, and plain and simply, our quality of life is better because for us, this is exactly where we want to be. I'll bring that picture around to something I mentioned at the beginning, which is that it's going to take all of us. And there's sometimes not a clear understanding of the part that we all play in this picture um, or in this story. But the fact of the matter is, is that the ranch Andrew and I don't function as standalone isolated units. We have a diverse array of, of partnerships from um, wildlife managers to, to public land managers, to a, a number of different NGOs, a number of different neighbors, all working together, having generative conversations um, based in this idea of, of collaboration and recognizing that we're really the only species that works within fence lines and perhaps things could be better off if we all work together um, because wolves nor weeds water nor wildfire works within those man-made boundaries that only we see so a lot of our focus has turned to building collaboratives that have real hope for landscape level change um, by engaging a, a diverse group of partners and neighbors. And that starts with really finding a common, common ground and a common goal that unites us. There's a lot, a lot of reason or, or a lot of, um, Sometimes it's easier to see all that divides us and all of the differences. And, and sometimes there's actually quite a lot of that. Uh, but if we can just find one point of common ground, and it could even be just talking about our kids for a while, <laughs> um, usually we can build on that and, and eventually things start to shift and we actually start to see how much we share and how, how much power we have together as a collective in, in doing all of our parts to, to move the future to a better and more hopeful place. Um, I'll share this quote that I really like. Healthy things, cattle, wolves, watersheds, communities, economies, and nations depend on a foundation of healthy relationships. I think a, a piece to this circle, you know, when you think about um, agriculture in general, all agricultural practices are driven by consumer preferences. And so one point of power that everyone else has is through the consumer choices that they make. And there's no question that today beef, cattle, and domestic livestock in general, as well as a number of farming practices can be extremely destructive to the land, to the environment, to wildlife, but equally is the opportunity for those to be incredibly powerful in, in being the change that we all desire. And so the choice of, of choosing to purchase and support ranchers and farmers who are ranching and farming with values versus not bothering to know the difference 
of of meat that costs almost nothing to produce raised with chemicals or injected with chemicals coming from a feedlot versus farmers and ranchers who are investing in regenerative practices and producing food while sustaining a robust, diverse ecosystem. It's a world of difference and we need to all step in and take our part in the story to see, to realize the opportunity that we hold to make, to, to realize the future that we desire. So I will end it there and I will look forward to seeing you all in the live question and answer session coming up. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jessica Odell, and I want to, you to think about me, not as a rancher, but as a human being. A human being that is a caretaker and a maintainer of open spaces. A human being that works in a complex, whole, natural environment. A human being that's looking for meaningful purpose and looking out for the next generation human, animal, and environment. I come from a diversified ranching family. We do all the labor ourselves, and we do not employ any outside help. We are one of the few operations in California, left in California, that can drive cattle without trucks to our summer range because of continuous open landscapes maintained by private ranches, private timber ground, as well as BLM and Forest Service agencies. Our cattle can go from the homestead to the base of Mount Shasta without coming inside of a house or crossing a paved road, which is roughly 45 miles. Late in the spring as the snow melts, the cattle migrate to the base of Mount Shasta for the summer with little assistance, and then naturally migrate back to the historic homestead for the winter. The purpose of my talk is to give you food for thought for the discussion to follow and hopefully reinforce how your conscious consumption is as vital to soil health and healing our planet as our agricultural practices are. I wanted to go over some working definitions so we will all be on the same page. Sustainable agriculture. To meet society's food and textile needs in the present without depleting the soil or the environment. The argument now is that past practices have degraded the environment too much, that sustaining is not good enough. We need to improve it. Which brings us to the regenerative agriculture movement. It is a system of agricultural principles and practices that increases biodiversity, enriches the soil, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystems. Healthy soils absorb more carbon, retain more water, and are richer in fertility. Plants are more varied and resilient. Domestic animals and wildlife are more diverse and plentiful. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have enough time to get into the cool science of all this stuff. And I'm by no means an expert. I feel like I'm just getting started. But I think one of the most cool things about regenerative agriculture is that livestock has the microorganisms in their gut to heal sick and sterile soil and start the regenerative process. By grazing land properly, they will reintroduce the microorganisms to the soil that need to be there. And holistic management. It's a value-based decision-making framework. It integrates all aspects of planning 
for social, economic, and environmental considerations. It pays attention to different aspects of the whole, and it comes from regenerative agriculture. It is a useful tool since it's difficult to make decisions that consider all three aspects, the social, financial, and environmental all the time. The use of test questions that combine thinking, logical questions with filling questions, as well as questions that focus on financial, biological, and social concerns is helpful. Test questions also help you consider the short-term and long-term consequences of your actions. Some decisions are economically sound, but are implemented at the expense of the environment or the well-being of people. Others may be environmentally sound, but economically unfeasible. It is meant to help navigate the complexity of the decision-making process. And here's a little diagram. I apologize, I'm not good with computers, so I went old school with a pen and paper and then took a picture of it. And it's meant to just, again, remind you that when you're working with nature, you cannot change or control one thing without impacting something else. And now I wanted to talk about how your conscious consumption can help us solve some of the challenges of um, marketing our regenerative products. And in my experience, it's not supply and demand. I have plenty of beef and I have plenty of people that want to buy it, but trying to get, get it to them is the challenge. And the challenge comes for me with product conversion, trying to find competent processors that put your beef into a package so that you're proud of all your hard work and happy to present it to your customer. Uh, there are a shortage of USDA processing places, and it's not just about having facilities. A lot of the facilities that do exist struggle with um, staffing and finding good skilled employees. Um, and often many of those people are overworked and underpaid. So coming up with good trade programs would be helpful. And then if you're lucky enough to get your product into a package, there's the distribution issue, especially when your products are perishable and raised in a rural area, getting them to an urban center um, can be difficult. And then there's the labeling issues uh, and certificates. Is it, do you do it? Yes, no, is it good or bad? Um, and then it seems like when you come up with a good label, uh, there's somebody there to copy you that takes a lot of the um, authenticity out of it. Uh, I've learned a lot about um, labeling, licensing, UPC codes, um, but really what I think it comes down to is if, you, if the consumer does their own research and knows who produces their food, then none of this is needed, which is a cost saving to the producer, which means it's a cost savings to the customer. If you know your producers, you don't, you don't need labels. And many labels, that's just how you're basing your buying processes on, 
um, can be tricky or confusing. I think we've all heard about like the cage-free chickens versus the free range versus pasture. Cage-free sounds great, but when they're just in a packed into a big warehouse without a uh, cage, their lifestyle has not been improved by a whole lot. Um, and I just think a lot back to before a lot of these regulations existed to my grandparents and great grandparents days. Um, my grandmother milked cows and churned butter and sold it locally to the mills, grocery stores, neighbors. Uh, my grandfather would butcher beef a week and sell it to the mills as well as the grocery stores. Um, but when we, you live in a community that knows you, um, that's been to your house, they know your hygiene practices, they know your farming practices, um, they feel comfortable buying your product without the wasted money of endorsements. And then, you know, there's the challenge of farmer marsh markets. They're great. They're really good when you're starting out. But again, if you're, you're from a rural area, you may have to drive a day or days to get to a farmer's market that has a large enough clientele um, that has the money to, to spend on a good product. Um, so you have to make a lot of money to justify three or four days packing and unpacking um, for a farmer's market for it not to become actually a financial loss. Um, and then you often have to work so hard to market your regenerative products that you're not spending the extra time on the land with your animals. You've just made yourself another job as a marketer or salesman. Um, there's a lot of time and energy um, in finding people to, to appreciate your regenerative products. So conscious consumption, it requires one key ingredient, knowledge. But now that I think about it, also effort and it's in the consumer's interest to be interested in where their food and clothing comes from. Research and know where your products come from and realize that shopping in a new way requires a behavior change and behavior changes require effort, placing value on the outcome of that change so that in the added complexity of a busy life it is justified. And I want you to imagine the positive power of change through consumer demand versus top-down regulation. Acknowledge whole product consumption. Don't only use and eat your favorite parts. Try to eat in season. Try to eat in your food shed. And understand that food raised properly will cost more. When consumers ask producers to give up many of the tools that were designed to take the cost out of production, then you're going to add cost to production. If there is no one out there to buy a more expensive product, then farms will fail and open spaces will be lost. It is the consumer that will decide how big the regenerative ag and holistic and holistic farming will become. And embrace all the extra benefits you get of a holistic food. The increased nutrients, the increased, um, the increased, or sequestering increased amounts of carbon and greenhouse gases. Carbon go, you can make carbon go from being bad for the environment to good for the environment. You're putting yourself at less risk for pathogens that are antibiotic resistant. You're contributing to rural revitalization. 
if producers are taking care of land and animals in a way that is healing the wounds on the land, they need to know that there will be people and consumers that are there with them and will buy their products and stand up for them in public hearings. I hope this will inspire you to start or continue being part of the solution by using your buying power for change. If we don't change our buying habits, then very little in the world will change. Big business, be it farmers, ranchers, the fashion, car industry, as well as many others, are supplying what we, the consumers, demand. Until our demands change, we will continue to get large quantities of cheap disposable products. Thank you for listening and letting me tell my story. Um, it is such a great honor to be here with you all today and have the opportunity to present. Um, I've had the great honor the last uh, few years to be able to participate on the coexistence panel that Sedona Wolf Week has hosted. And I really wanted to give a shout out uh, to the Sedona Wolf Week team uh, for being willing to expand um, the conversation in the manner that they are today with this particular panel. And I'm looking forward to being able to share some of my thoughts and perspectives and continuing this uh, very important discussion. Thank you. Hello, as you know, my name is Karen Vardaman and I'm the manager for the Working Circle Initiative, which is an initiative of Defenders of Wildlife. And we were founded back in 2016, actually under the California Wolf Center. And I know some of you um, have heard about our efforts in coexistence working on the ground with ranchers in the past. Um, but for today, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit differently. For this segment, um, you've heard some very inspiring presentations from very inspiring people that are my personal heroes, actually. They live it every day, they take action every day to better the planet, and in their talks they provided some real tangible examples of how they work to make a difference and ways in which each of us can make an impact. I am honored to be part of this most thought-provoking segment and help forward the conversation on a more holistic level. And listening to these folks brings me hope for a better future and a better way forward for all. So for my part, as I mentioned, I just want to build upon what was shared from my own humble experiences and perspectives and hopes of forwarding uh, continuing discussions um, beyond this panel. So this uh, first slide, I, this quote I found was very interesting and I think it does talk well to our discussions. And it was something I actually um, just uh, learned about yesterday <laughs> and added it in. And it's called the danger of a single story. And basically when a particular story about a group of people, in our case, perhaps it's ranchers, perhaps it's wolf advocates, is told over and over again, it then becomes our single story. And it becomes a stereotype that although may be true for some, it is incomplete because it is not true for all. And this quote goes on to discuss the incredible but very harmful power that this single story can hold when it is told over and over again. And we are often guilty of this, and I know I am. And when you stick to the assumptions our stories or other stories have told you, you miss out on a great opportunity to know what the real story is. And we had that opportunity today uh, listening to some of the folks. And that story is often, as you've heard today, even more powerful and more important to hear. And just like there is a balance in nature, there needs to be a balance in how we work with others and how we go about our advocacy work. And by sticking to a single story, we create a barrier of assumptions that inhibit our ability to move forward in a meaningful way. Blanket statements such as all ranchers or wolf killers or all grazing on public land is bad or all wolf advocates, environmentalists or hypocrites crazy or out to destroy our way of life doesn't help move the needle forward for wolves or ranching. And as individuals, we have a responsibility to be sure we know what the whole story is so that we do not spread or encourage these biases <laughs> that are not only not true or half truths but it can actually cause harm to the cause that we are trying to serve. I did find this extremely um, powerful statement. And in my own early experience as a wolf advocate, 
it too had a very single story based on what I was taught and heard. And I had no reason to believe otherwise. You know, I'm part of a community that I love and respect, like-minded people with shared values, doing incredible and amazing work for the earth. And even in my early coexistence work, it was based on my single story, my own agenda, my goal, my needs, what I wanted to see as that outcome. And this often leads to a very linear approach, a very easily measured approach. I only knew half the story, that single story. And little did I know is that oftentimes the actions and the things I said were hurting the wolves that I fought to protect. But then one day, I had my story completely turned upside down due to a few people like Jess and Hillary and Andrew and others who took a risk on me, the hardcore wolf advocate, and opened their hearts and homes to share their story. Initially, I was so confused and honestly overwhelmed. What I was seeing and learning didn't match my single story. And I didn't know what to do with this newly discovered whole story of what veil of what I'd always been told, how it had always been done was lifted. But as the new light came in, new hope presented itself. It enabled me to see things from the inside out, different from what I was read or taught. And one thing I learned is that science and the polls and the studies don't always translate to the realities on the ground and to the people that you're writing about. And I realized that there is nothing singular or linear about wolf conservation or for ranchers who stir those lands. The real story is dynamic. It's about the real, the raw, and it's not easy, but it's exciting and there's ex exists great hope. And shortly after, um, I was shared this book actually from Hillary, and there was one passage that I read and it just really hit home. I thought it was extremely powerful and I wanted to share that with you today. Um, in 1996, I had an anguish question in my mind. Why didn't environmentalists and ranchers get along better? In theory, they shared many of the same hopes and fears, a love of wildlife, a deep respect for nature, an appreciation for life lived outdoors, and a common concern for healthy water, land, and food. That was the theory anyway. I felt anguish because this fight had all the hallmarks of a tragedy. Both sides and all of us in between seemed destined to lose what was most valued by everyone, the health and diversity of the West wild open spaces and the wild animals that live there, lost to urban development and misplayed values. And that to me was a huge turning point, so powerful and so true and has been the basis for a lot of the work that I continue to do. You know, why can't we have that win-win scenario? There's more in common that there are differences. Why has the conversation gone so wrong in so many ways? And the single story actually goes both ways. Recently, I was in the field um, working and was approached by a rancher couple curious as to why we were out there. And as we conversed, they looked at me all of a sudden and said, are you one of those wolf people? I was taken aback and I knew they weren't referring to the British rock band depicted in this picture. <laughs> I immediately felt offensive, unsure how to respond and even guilty for being a wolf person. But this question was based on their single story of me. And I had an opportunity to now expand the conversation. My answer was simply, well, yes and no. It depends on how you define wolf people then followed a productive and positive discussion after the shock that a wolf advocate could indeed be a rancher advocate as well. So to move forward, we must be first willing and able to lower those uh, barriers of assumptions and expand the single story to that whole story. And so just as the wolf is neither saint nor sinner, <laughs> nor are those working towards wolf recovery and those who steward the lands that they perhaps reside on. It is neither helpful to over glorify or vilify the wolf. The same goes for the people involved, no matter where you stand or where your values lie. Know the story. So perhaps it's time to change the paradigm and how we look at the challenges advocacy brings in a more comprehensive and meaningful way. And Bessie and her team are doing that today with this panel, I believe. If we can consider and include the whole and honest story, we can begin to change the conversation and we could be much stronger long-term. We can find that win-win story at the end. 
I liken it to the three-legged stool analogy. Correct the balance and effort that has led to the same repeating story of wolf recovery since the introduction of wolves to the greater Yellowstone area. And in many ways it has. We've seen wolves return, great celebration in new areas, then conflict begins with human activities, then wolves are lethally taken, more conflict between people continue, and we see this repeated pattern. Maybe if we take a more balanced look and look at all three of the dynamics with equal effort, appreciation, and respect, perhaps we can move this needle forward. We know that wolf recovery is not linear, nor the challenges that come with it. And if you focus on only one leg, one part, perhaps it fails. It is the strength of all three and all of us being willing to look at all issues equally, wolves, livestock, and people being successful that allows for the effort to stand strong. You know, the landscape simply isn't the same as it was 25, 50, or 100 years ago. And that is the reality that ranchers and urban wildlife advocates must work within. As human population increases and competition for open space by wildlife and human use increases, co-occurrence co co with livestock and wildlife and cattle is absolutely certain. And the man-created boundary between wild and working lands has become unsustainable. The and in the middle has become a battleground with no winners. And perhaps again, it is time to change that. It is time to remove the and and look forward instead of backwards. Focus on holistic approaches to the conversation check conservation challenges that we face. You know, and it's, it's not about asking anyone to give up their values or about what they believe. It's about respecting where people are at and working within that, being able to take the risk to reach across in order to learn what those real stories as, so that we can connect the dots, put together the pieces of the whole puzzle and connect the people and with the people as we move forward. It's about time that we take the time to understand that whole story. It does take a village, as they say, and we all come at these challenges and wolf that wolves face from different angles and different expertise, and it requires that. We certainly all can't do everything, but we cannot work in a vacuum either. And it's not easy. It's much easier to stay safe behind these lines we draw, but this work requires a deeper understanding. And as I said before, it's about the real and the raw. And within that, there does exist that great hope. Having wolves on the landscape doesn't have to be the expense of ranching. And having ranching doesn't have to be the expense of wolves. Having one does not mean we can't have the other. For example, regarding coexistence, what's amazing about many of the strategies that livestock producers are employing is that they not only are able to reduce vulnerability in cattle to predation, but these same strategies work to improve the land and wildlife habitat, things they've already been doing for decades. And these same practices provide co-benefits and economy and efficiency. Again, creating that win-win scenario we always hope for. And the more that the urban public can come to recognize and appreciate these efforts, ranchers can gain more of the respect um, folks like Hillary and Just Deserve. And hopefully this translates into high, higher market support for their efforts as well. We all must grow and evolve as advocates in our actions in order to serve the cause we are so passionate. You've heard Jess and Hillary and Andrew's stories and you've heard Amy's. <laughs> and along with each and every one of you, we all have incredible stories to share and they're all valid and important ones. It is time that we work together and instead of against each other, it's time we take actions that work to neutralize the polarizing debate versus fueling the fire surrounding sustainable ranching and wolf conservation. And it really is simple as this. If our mindset is different, then our activities will be different. I particularly love this story because this was a group of um, urban uh, young uh, high school students uh, that live in Oakland. And uh, they learned of all the great things that Jessica was doing on her ranch. And they put together the, this drawing and they all signed it. And it's not that Jess really wants to be known in her community for protecting wolves. But again, it was that recognition, you know, of, of each other and that we all have an important part in, in, in how we move forward and how we look at each other as neighbors instead of perhaps sitting on that other side of that line. 
you know, and change of mindset is not easy. It certainly wasn't for me, especially when it speaks to core values and things that are very identity based, but we all have a choice and it is our choice. We can remain stuck, feed into the same old cycle, or we can take a risk and choose a better path. And I do think of Jess's story. Sorry, Jess, I don't mean to keep putting you on the spot here, but um, I'm always so inspired by you and Hillary and everyone. You know, when I first met her parents, they were pretty unsure of who I was and why we were there in their community talking about bulls, <laughs> you know, and then just took the risk and uh, joined us in Montana a couple times and and started to, to work on these incredible projects that you've heard her talk about and just transformative uh, things that she's doing. And her son, that's often with her, you know, growing up with her on the land. And it just, I look at the incredible work she's doing now and the difference it's gonna make for our, our, our future. And how can we possibly look at that in anything else but something that is incredibly positive? That next generation of ranch uh, range stewards <laughs> are right there, right in front of us. So looking forward, you know, what can we each do just in our own daily lives? You know, we hear what, you know, those folks are doing on their lands and what those of us do professionally, but what about, you know, um, collectively uh, as a community? Well, first of all, just being willing to move beyond those myths. Um, you know, we always talk about producers can't make good management based on myths surrounding the wolf, and that's true. And urban advocates can't make good decisions based on myths surrounding what happens on those working lands. Because um, we're not there, we're not living it each and every day as they are. So being willing to look beyond those myths is a great and simple thing to do in itself. Um, know where your food comes from. <laughs> you know, support ranchers who are doing the right thing for the right reason. Um, perhaps if you're becoming a vegan just for wolves, maybe that's not the answer. Maybe it is for you as a personal choice, but maybe supporting those ranchers that are doing this good work can then help them be that light in their community and that can help spread and grow. Um, make sure you understand the whole dynamic story, not the single story, like this picture of this family here. Man, you know, they have multi-generational family because of the conservation work they do. Um, they've got a huge um, endangered sage grouse colony that Lex right there on their land. They could have made different choices about how they manage their land. They could have sold it to development in that area. The prices are pretty high right now and probably been better off, but they didn't because they care just as we care. Perhaps use one last piece of plastic. Um, Amy's story just blows me away. Um, I try in my way, <laughs> maybe a long time before I can get to where she is. You know, reach across and build those relationships with those that may not be part of your direct community. It really is quite rewarding to hear other people's stories. Being cause driven. This is one that always helps me day to day. Think about the actions we take, including the things we say. Is it helping truly or hurting the cause we serve? There's that old rhyme that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, I disagree because our words can hurt. <laughs> you know, often the actions we take in defense of our cause is actually counterproductive to the cause we serve, and certainly not intentional. For example, when we do publicly speak out against ranching as a whole, we, we, we spread the single story, making those negative blanket statements. That doesn't help wolves. It only creates more social resentment towards wolves, resistance and willingness to, to work together and, and to try to implement maybe perhaps coexistence practices. And it's understandable. <laughs> the same goes perhaps even for producers who promote or shout the SSS, shoot, shovel and shut up, this doesn't help their cause and gaining support for ranching, including market support, it only fuels those efforts to perhaps push them off the landscapes and encourages advocates to not support their product. So it goes again both ways. If you're truly cause driven, let the cause guide your actions. Ask yourself, is what you say or do actually serve the cause or will it hurt it long term? Just be mindful. You know, and sometimes it can get pretty uh, overwhelming, <laughs> everything and all the what's happening in the world and all the different ways that we may be able to help or not help. And for some, and I've heard this often, it's just too much. So, so why even bother? How can one person really make a difference? But we can. Um, before I got into wolf work, I was actually a marine scientist and worked many years um, at Ocean Institute in Dana Point. 
And one time we did this public program and it was called Do As Bubbles Do. And it talked about the important role that oceans play in helping um, sequest gar uh, carbon from our atmosphere. The fact that all those waves, the, the, the white water out there, <laughs> actually helps capture the carbon and bring it down into the oceans. You know, the oceans are as vast as our intent and vision for a better future, future, and the oceans are as powerful as our ability to make a difference. But the oceans do it one bubble at a time. When you hear a wave crash, the sound you're hearing are bubbles bursting. And each one of those bubbles help capture a little bit of carbon and clean the air. The rougher the water, the more the white water, the more they do. So each one of those bubbles <laughs> doesn't really do a lot. You can imagine how small they are and the billions that they are, but all together, those bubbles have a huge role in making a difference in the air that we breathe. Without them, we couldn't survive. So just that one little thing, maybe it's just turning off a light, just do as bubbles do. So if everyone just takes a breath, takes the time to think about the small individual actions, where does my meat come from? Do I really need to use that plastic? <laughs> Is what I'm saying accurate? And does it truly serve my cause? Does this action help or hurt, lead to a better outcome or fuel the flames? Each one of us has the power to move the needle forward. Each and every small decision and action will together be very transformative. You've heard Jess, Hillary, and Andrew's stories, and you've heard Amy's. We all have incredible stories to share, and they're all valid and important ones, and we need to listen. So it's time that we work to neutralize that polarizing debate that has hindered wolves, livestock, and people to thrive on shared landscapes. It's time to take the risk cross the field, work together instead of against each other, and discover a brighter future for wolves and the wild working landscapes they call home. Thanks so much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. We got a full house today. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, excellent. What a fantastic presentation. And we have a lot of comments and questions coming in. So I'm going to ask those commenting, please, because we took all three of your presentations and merged them into one. So when they're commenting and questioning, I'm not exactly sure which one they're referring to. So if you could identify it by Karen's, uh, Hillary's, or Jess's, that would be great. And I'll be sure to ask them. So Starting with introductions for everybody, we've got Karen Vardaman from Working Circle. Give us a give us a wave, Karen. Uh, yeah. Seattle Wolf Week alum. Good to see you again, Hillary. Good to see you too. <laughs> Hillary Anderson, who came and saw us in person last year in Sedona. Good to see you, uh, Jess Odo, a uh, rancher in Northern California, and so gr so great to have you with us this year. Welcome. Thank you. And Amy Unterreiner, who you didn't hear on the presentation uh, just now, but she's actually up next with her husband, Dave, to talk about Zero to Waste. But she's here today because she was actually inspired to start that effort because of the other ladies here on the call today. So with that said, wow, that was a lot. That was a lot of fantastic information. Um, where shall we start? Uh, there was a question here about values, and uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think maybe this might have been directly directed to you, Hillary. When you talk about values, they want to know if you're referring to the role of ranchers and wolf people or all people in general. Um, I might need a little bit more context on specifically where that question was coming from. Yeah, I think I, 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 I think that might have been in my talk. Okay, Karen, go ahead. I know. Could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I talk about speaking to different values. It's really about respecting, you know, those values and understanding that, you know, we all come from different places based on our own experiences, based on where we were raised, um, based on our own um you know, passions in our lives and the causes that we serve. And it's really important to recognize those and to speak to those and to work with those and try to come up with, 
you know, solutions that meet those values, because that's where sometimes the conflict or misunderstanding comes from. It's really not about the person or even um, what it is they're doing, but it's these identity-based values that are very personal to us. Um, so that's what I was speaking to, you know, is just the need to be able to speak to and contain, hold all the different values when we look at av- advocacy work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, Karen, about um, some of the things that we've been doing with Hillary and Jess and some of the, the things that you do out in the field? I know you touched on a little bit in the presentation, but um, if there's any additional detail and we can get Hillary and Jess's opinion on this as well. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, Working Circle um, is now with uh, Defenders of Wildlife. However, when we were founded, um, you know, the idea was to be in that radical middle space, and it still is, and to find a place, a safe place, where folks that both, you know, love and advocate for wolves and those that are actually stewarding the land <laughs> where wolves are going to live can come together and share and, and look at ways to work together, you know, instead of against each other. And the way that we have done that is by allowing the producers to have a greater voice in what that looks like, because nobody knows the situation better than they do. And so, so much, again, goes back to that understanding So it's about bringing folks together, allowing producers to kind of lead the coexistence for lack of another word, effort, um, create that greater understanding around the challenges and issues um, and recognizing where people are at and meeting where they're at. So our focus is, you know, we we try to implement long-term strategies um, that help reduce vulnerability in cattle to predation, look at ways that we can support these working lands and becoming uh, more sustainable and resilient. Um, supporting folks, you know, that are doing great work out there. And then looking at that social capacity side too, because without that basic understanding and the ability to have a conversation to start with <laughs> and looking at ways that we might need to change that conversation, we're not going to be able to meet some of the goals that we're all passionate about. So that's kind of what um, our efforts have been based on, is partnerships and trust in those relationships. Absolutely. <laughs> And I want to say that I've learned so much, um, actually, especially from Hillary, who we have talked often over the last year. And Hillary, I'd like you to share um, with the audience some of the things that you've been doing that actually go beyond just coexisting with predators uh, and, and our native carnivores on, in your land. I mean, talk about some of the soil regeneration work and some of the other things that you guys are doing that really puts you in balance with your environment. Sure. Um, so I think, I think based on my experience, a little bit of a conclusion that I and my husband, who's not here today, um, his name is Andrew, a little bit of a conclusion that we've come to um, is that these challenges that we're facing, um, you know, the challenge around coexistence with carnivores being one of them really is not solved on the level of methods. It really goes a lot deeper and gets a lot bigger than that. And for us, it really, um, it really taps into this idea of ranch resilience. And so within the idea of ranch resilience, we're looking at moving ultimately out of what I consider a self-destructive system to a self-sustainable one, meaning that an input in one area is transferred throughout the rest of the operation. And of course, vice versa, um, a self-destructive system would be one where you're, you're in the mindset of exploitation or extracting worth or value as opposed to one of service. And the really amazing thing is that, you know, I guess for us, it comes down, it's really a matter of mindset. And so methods are a function of mindset and mindset, like Karen spoke about, has a lot to do with the social social aspect (laughs) fueling the conflict that that seems to predominate especially in in 
the matter of wildlife related issues. But I guess back to mindset, um, for us thinking about it in terms of a fixed mindset or a growth mindset, and a growth mindset, really, you're constantly striving and seeking and, and asking why. And so um, when we're in that place, mentally, that mental space, it really is, it just um, frames the whole thing up in a really different way. And, and so you start uh, instead of like this year, for example, we had a grasshopper infestation and, you know, grasshoppers wiped out um, a massive amount of the forage that we had stockpiled. And the kind of traditional mindset is to think, well, what sort of chemical is out there to kill the grasshoppers? And when you're in more of a growth mindset space, you start thinking, you know, well, why were the grasshoppers here and what species in particular did they target? And, oh, they targeted this species because this grass species is particularly stressed and it's stressed because of drought and drought is a function of, of the soils or well, the plant community and the plant community is a function of, of the soil and um, the soil, the microbiology in the soil. And, uh, you know, it just all of a sudden this whole web of relationships starts unfolding and, uh, it's it's fascinating. It it's really being a part of those relationships is really what gets us up and motivated every day. And and so we're of recently paying a lot of attention to soil in particular and and learning just how, how much this <laughs> whole underground world is contributing to everything that we see and experience above ground and. There's a lot to say on that, but I'll stop because I know I know Jess has a lot to add on this and so does Karen. I was just gonna say, Jess, you look like you're calling in from the field and I know you guys either had storms or are getting storms. So um, please chime in. Oh yeah, no, we're had quite the storm this morning and now we're, I think it's kind of blowing out and we'll have a couple of days in between the next storm. Um, but yeah, I think I'm kind of in the same spot as Hillary as far as, you know, it's a continual, you're continually learning. And I think I had the big aha this last year is really, yeah, the it is from the ground up. It's from the soil up and, you know, learning all the soil science, um, you know, and then how that works all the way up the food chain. And um, I also have a healthcare background. And what it kind of reminds me of is that, you know, I think the world in general, we've gotten ourselves um, completely off balance with many things, but like the microbiome and um, good bacteria and fungus and, you know, so many others that, you know, just like in a lot of healthcare settings, we're talking about all the good bacteria that we've acted accidentally been killing off with antibiotics and stuff and how, you know, we're really focusing on rebuilding the microbiome in people's guts so that you're, you prevent the problems rather than getting sick and then treating the symptoms. And I think that's hopefully where agriculture is going with the soil is that we're really reappreciating all the like bacterial, um, fungus diversity in the soil and how we need to build that back up and support that. And, um, and once we kind of get that dialed in, then a lot of other things fall into place. Or Alan Savory talks about really continually uh, searching for the root cause that oftentimes we get in the habit of treating symptoms, um, which may help for, you know, a small period of time, but it's like, you know, continually putting a Band-Aid on and then you get dependent on a lot of the symptom treatment instead of continually looking for the root cause, kind of like Hillary was talking about with the grasshoppers. Well, then you look at the grass and then the grass is stressed. Well, why is the grass stressed? And continuing that why, why, why till you can kind of work on the, the root cause. What wonderful stewards you both are. 
of, of, of your lens. Um, that's just an incredible. And I don't think a lot of people think about that or, or realize that. Right. And that's why we definitely wanted to have you, you on today to share your stories, um, which segues, segues me into the next subject, because there is a question here and I'll just use the term predator friendly meat. <laughs> and the reason why I'm chuckling a little is Hillary, Jess, Karen, Paula, Amy, and I have been working um, for quite some time on, you know, trying to actually create that that type of product and it's not so simple as calling it predator friendly we have found but where one of the questions is where could we find what we'll call right now predator friendly meat or how can we further support uh people like you and hillary you and jess and, and this could be open to anyone or all of you probably have some suggestions on that Jess, do you want to mention your Shasta, Mount Shasta Wild? Yes. You yeah, know, well, I, mean, I, I think, you know, and it's funny because you would think it would be as easy as like, here, check out these websites and these brands and, you know, order <laughs> order a shopping cart full and you're set. And that's, I think, kind of what I was trying to touch on in my talk. And then like what Betsy was talking about, what we're trying to work on is it's, there's a huge disconnect from getting the good product to the consumer that'll appreciate it as far as, you know, whether it's rural distance when you're dealing with perishable um, products. And so it's hard. And I think there's a lot of things in the, in the works, but um, you know, even if somebody isn't dealing with a lot, well, there's a lot of different predator issues. So probably everybody deals with a little something, um, but that's where, you know, even if you're not fi finding specific um, product that comes from like wolf countries, if you can really concentrate on doing your research um, on the company you're buying your food from, your clothing from, or if you can find, you know, uh, real small businesses, um, oftentimes you can talk to like owner operators. Um, and get a feel of, of where their values are and if this is something that you'd like to support with your your buying dollar because i think that's where you know change comes from and we're seeing it now with bigger companies that are wanting to source um ethically raised meat and stuff like that but they found that they've kind of rat hold themselves so much in this conventional mo model that it's very hard to get the quantity that they need to just market something as like predator, predator friendly and have a consistent supply. So yeah, if you can just take time and research your products and, and make sure that their story is authentic. Yeah, absolutely. And I can say firsthand to those listening, it's not as, it's, uh, Jess is exactly right. It's not as easy as slapping a, a label on a package and you're good to go. And in fact, it's something we've been noodling and working on for quite some time. Um, and that's a great point, Jess, about doing your homework, which I know Amy dug, digs into a little bit because Amy's all about zero to waste. So she went out of her way to research and find places to source uh, products, ethically sourced meat and other products um, and took waste into consideration as well. So I'm sure I'll be sharing her tips in the next segment, which is coming up very quickly. Um, we have a lot of people here uh, who, and I, and I know I'm saying it again, but any parting comments on how they can best support. We've heard from Jess, you know, have that discernment, do your homework. Uh, Hillary and Karen, any last parting comments for the viewers that you would like them to know about you or what you're doing or how they can help? You know, I would just say just really being aware, you know, and doing your research, you know, obviously on the products you buy is important, but also about what you hear out there and making sure that whatever story you're passing on is the real and whole story. Because, you know, if it wasn't for people like Jess, you know, and Hillary, um, who just like, turned my whole world upside down as a hardcore wolf advocate when I first got into this, you know, wouldn't have been able to do some of the, the great things um, and the good work, um, you know, for, for predators as well as the relationships built. Um, and I'm just so grateful they came on <laughs> to share their story because people need to hear their story and supporting folks 
like them um, because we need these open spaces. Um, We need (laughs) healthy lands. We need to start looking at this in this comprehensive way. We can't be linear and just focusing on you know, one thing, it's really about this ecological um, and economical, because if these guys can't survive, then they can't do what they're doing. Um, And looking at things in a very comprehensive, holistic manner. Um, And same thing with what um, Amy does, you know, I'm still striving to get a little bit better each day. Um, But it's so inspiration and makes us realize that we can do it. You know, it is possible. And it's, uh, um, it just takes those little steps. Yeah, and it's all about uh, people, uh, something attainable, right? Just little bits at a time, and so it doesn't seem overwhelming. And uh, and I agree with you, Karen. Um, I have learned a lot from Hillary and Jess this past year, and so I fully support what they're trying to do, and I and I hope others do as well. Um, Hillary, do you want to you want to take us home with a parting comment, or <laughs> I could just. Um a little extension from both Karen and Jess and a, a little um, a, a well-deserved nod to you, Betsy, um, because I, I think what what all of us, what, what you guys can do to help is, is engage like Betsy did and like Karen did and like Jess and Amy did. Like none of us had to reach out and none of us had to start this gathering here together but everybody saw, uh, you know, everybody stepped outside of their box a little bit and asked the questions that you're asking and, and didn't, didn't forget about it. And so, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that ranchers need at the end of the day, in order to keep the ranch at the very minimum, (laughs) need to make enough of a livelihood. And our livelihood comes from the sale the the production, the growth, the sale of of food. And so ultimately customer preferences drive agricultural practices. If we have consumers who don't know the difference or who don't care about beef raised with values versus beef raised without, then, then we're going to have agriculture go in that direction. But if the, the customer cares and bothers to know the difference and and then we have a market to to provide food with values to all of you we'll connect the circle and things will start to change and and ultimately that needs to happen on a small scale and and from there grow out to really affect landscape level change that that we all desire that's in all of our best interest and so um if you're interested keep in touch with Betsy and keep in touch with Karen and, and Jess and Amy and I will be in touch with them. And like, let's see what, let's see how big we can grow the circle together. Absolutely. What a beautiful ending, Hillary. Thank you. And Thank you. I know we ran over a little bit into your time, Amy, but you're up next. So let's everybody sign out and we'll get Amy and Dave going and Jess, thank you so much for calling in from the field. I know you've been hanging out out there for us. I really appreciate it. Hillary, it's always great to see you and hear your voice. And Karen, as always, thanks for being such huge supporters of Sedona Wolf Week. And we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Thank you so much, all of you.